Hi everyone, welcome to the interstitial lung disease.info podcast or video channel, depending on where you're watching slash listening. In this episode, I'd like to talk about sarcoidosis follow-up clinics and how I personally do those clinics. Um, my name is Stefan Stanel. I'm a physician working in the UK. I am an ILD specialist. And of course, I do see quite a lot of um, patients with sarcoidosis in these follow-up clinics. And I'd like to just go over how I would normally run these clinics. Now, this may differ to your practice. So if you're a clinician doing sarcoidosis clinics somewhere else in the world, you may have a completely different practice. I may not cover some things that you would be doing in your clinics, or perhaps you might get some new ideas from what I'm doing. And I think sharing this information may be helpful. Now, I do understand that all over the world, you have different uh, practice styles or access to different therapies may and tests and things like that may be different. And the way you structure your consultations may be different. You may not have dedicated time to see patients in, uh, in a dedicated clinic. So there, there may be a lot of differences. Um, and the UK, in a sense, is a little bit particular in some ways. Uh, I'm not saying it's better or worse than other places because it doesn't really matter. As long as the patient has a good outcome, it doesn't really matter how you structure the clinic and what, what you do as long as at the end the patient is well looked after. And I, I think that's the main thing. I'm not um, born in the UK, as you may notice from my accent. So I'm, I've been tr trained in Romania. So I do understand a little bit that sometimes you may not have access to certain tests. And I have actually dealt with that during my training. So I'm well aware of the limitations in some parts of the world. And that being said, sort of as a context, I'd like to just go over a typical follow-up consultation for a stable sarcoidosis patient just to sort of um, get an idea of what I would do. I mean, if this is interesting to you uh, or, you know, shocking to you or some, uh, well, well, we'll just see. But, um, right, so the way I'll structure it is basically I'll, in this uh, episode and the remainder of the episode, I'll go over a couple of things. So first of all, symptoms, what symptoms do I ask about? How do I do sort of an organ review? what sort of tests I would order, and then at the end, what sort of advice I would give to patients who are asking about whether treatment is necessary in their case or other lifestyle issues related to their sarcoidosis. So first of all, um, I would probably prepare the clinic a little bit if I can. If I know who the patient is, who is coming, I'd probably just look into their history a little bit. If I have some records in my system, in my hospital, I would probably dig them out a little bit before the clinic. Now, we, we do have electronic patient records, so I can um, see older letters normally. Now, this I know is not the case uh, in other places in the world, but ideally, towards the beginning of the consultation or just before, it would be useful to just find out if your patient indeed has sarcoidosis. <laughs> so the reason for that is because we have surprises sometimes in clinic where patients turn up, they think they have sarcoidosis, perhaps they're not treated, but actually on closer review, diagnosis has never been confirmed and there are questions around the diagnosis. So ideally I'd want to know if the patient has, had had a biopsy at some point in, in their history, where the biopsy was, uh, site was and what was the result. So I'd like to collate this information. Now, this is my practice. I tend to collate all the information into a clinical letter that's as comprehensive as possible so that the next clinician will have an easier job at dealing with that particular case. This may not be uh, what you could do, but uh, you know, depending on uh, where you live, uh, you know, different practices may call for that. So um, I would like to know that the diagnosis has been confirmed. Uh, that I know the site of biopsy, I know more or less the extent of the disease beforehand. So if the patient has had high calcium levels, for example, it's a useful information to have because it will guide what I will request and what I'll keep an eye on. If they have heart involvement, I may elicit more, um, I may ask more questions about palpitations and things like that. So, so it's important to have some background information on your patient if you can. Then once the patient is in, I'll probably want to find out 
about their current medications and the timeline of having had different treatments for sarcoidosis. So for example, if they were on methotrexate at some point, if they were on corticosteroids, what doses, when, uh, were there short, of sor short bursts of steroids for maybe two months and then they stopped or not. So different patients will have different um, treatments uh, given to them in the past. And it's quite important to note what reaction they had uh, to those treatments, if they had a good response or not. I think that's quite important. It's important to also make a note of other comorbidities the patient may have, which may not be sarcoid related, but just to keep track of everything. So I know this uh, doesn't sound like very specialist care so far because I'm just trying to collate all this information, but sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease. You cannot just treat the lungs if you're a pulmonologist. I, I, I have a feeling that that's a wrong practice. You may disagree with me, but I, I have a feeling you can't just rely on other specialists all the time. I tend to rely on other specialists for specific things. So, for example, eye involvement in sarcoidosis, I would probably refer the patient for a specialized eye review uh, with an ophthalmologist rather than me trying to look at their eyes and um, trying to treat that. So I, I do believe that some organ systems need to be treated by the specialists. And I, as a pulmonologist, will focus on the lungs, of course, but I will try my best to get to to elicit the symptoms that would suggest other organs are involved. Now, that's sort of the beginning of the consultation, but even before I begin that, I tend to set the scene and the context for the patient to be able to express what they are feeling, to have uh, some comfort that I am there to listen to their complaints and issues. And I think that's really important. I never 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 try to rush my patients as much as i can even though sometimes time is difficult to find for us as doctors i think it's really important if you start off for one minute you just talk about other things rather than the disease itself you might actually gain time <laughs> during the consultation because the, you will gain the you will have gained the patient's trust and they will be more likely to just focus on what's important. So I would actually just tell them what the clinic is about, what we generally can and cannot do, what we that we are there to support them, and that I may have to ask them a, a lot of con uh, questions that may feel like an interrogation, but it's just me trying to find out what's the extent of their sarcoidosis and if there's been any progression, if, if we need to intervene with treatment. And I think if I say that, most patients will have um, better understanding of what's about to happen. <laughs> they won't be surprised. They won't feel that we're dwelling on a lot of things, that we're jumping from one thing to the other. And I think if we keep uh, that sort of level of engagement and communication with our patients, we'll actually have uh, a much better consultation and it will be more productive. Now, in terms of symptoms, so when I elicit symptoms from patients, initially I let them run the show. So I may ask them, how, how's it going? I'll, I'll ask them some, some sort of an open-ended questions. Uh, and I'll let them sort of tell me what's going on for a minute or so. They may tell me about their breathing. They may tell me about some rash they have. But then I would sort of quickly try to direct the conversation a little bit so that I can cover all the things that are important. So because I'm a pulmonologist, of course, I will start off by focusing on the lung symptoms. So if their breathlessness has been stable, that's my main concern. Have they bec become more breathless since last time they've seen a doctor in the last six months, 12 months? Have there been any progression or worsening in their exercise capacity, let's say? And I try to quantify that by number of flights of stairs they can climb before they stop, if they're... Uh, doing as much exercise as they were before how how long would they have to would they go until they would feel breathlessness these sort of things i think are important to give even a subjective uh, quantification that can be used by the next clinician who will see the patient if that is documented they will have an idea of how things are going and progressing and i would also ask about other th things such as a cough or a wheeze when that occurs if there's any other reason for having these symptoms you know besides the sarcoidosis if they have acid reflux things like that so that that conversation tends to to move a little bit away from just focusing on the lungs to focusing on other things as well and i try to sort of gently move from one organ system to the next 
once I'm done with and I'm satisfied that I've listed all that I could elicit regarding the chest symptoms, I would probably then d try to direct the conversation in such a way as to uh, get the general organ review. So I would generally start with uh, the outside and sort of go in, if that makes sense. So I would ask them about any skin symptoms, if they have any rashes, if they can potentially show me that rash, if um, they have any eye symptoms, so if they have any blurred vision, if they have any sort of conjunctival, conjunctival redness or other conjunctival symptoms, things like that, that would make me make note of any potential involvement. I would then move on to discuss about symptoms related to the heart, especially unprovoked palpitations. This is one of the main questions that I think needs to be asked in a sarcoidosis consultation. If the patient is having unprovoked episodes of palpitations, it's important to note how long these last for, um, if uh, they occur very often, how often they occur, basically, that's a great question because it might guide what sort of test I may request, if, the, if I can request any test. So for example, later on, I may think about doing an ECG. I may think about a 24 hour monitor if we have episodes of palpitations daily. And that's important to, to try to gauge the, cardio, the cardiac risk of sarcoid involvement. Then I would also ask about um, nervous system symptoms so if they have any paresthesias, if they have any weakness in any limbs or any uh, unusual sensations anywhere in the body, things like that would probably be very important to ask. And any symptoms that are elicited in that way will guide the tests and investigations and the referrals that I will do next. In terms of uh, physical exam, I would probably, after I've elicited all the symptoms, I would probably just gently ask the patient if, uh, if they could sort of, um, if they would allow me to have a, a little bit of a listen to their chest, to just maybe check their skin a little bit, maybe their eyes, their limbs, just do a sort of a general examination, probably with a focus mostly on the lungs, uh, because I'm a pulmonologist and usually the patients that I see have lung involvement. And obviously I'm listening for crepitations, I'm listening for things that would suggest that the sarcoid involvement in their lungs is turning fibrotic because then you, know, you might want to consider some treatment if that's a new thing. I would then think about doing some tests. Again, the tests for sarcoidosis are designed to cover most organ systems. So in terms of the lungs, obviously the important test for us is the lung function, the spirometry and, and the gas transfer. So if you are able to access gas transfer Measurements, they are quite important in the monitoring sarcoidosis because they're usually the, the first to drop. So the gas transfer um, percent predictors is the first one to drop rather than the actual FVC. So if you only have access to spirometry, I mean, that's useful, but gas transfer is really essential. Maybe at least once a year to do a gas transfer measurement would be helpful to determine whether things are actually stable. And it might... Um, if you have very stable lung function, including gas transfer, you might not need to do any CT scans or imaging because you may be quite confident that actually things are stable and you can put a number on that um, functional status. Lung functions, like I said, I would probably do it, well, depends on, this is where it depends a lot where you are in the world. In the UK, I must admit that we are not very good at doing a lot of lung function. And it's to do with how lung function is not really done by the, the physician in clinic. It's, it's usually done in a lung function lab that has a lot of scheduling slots and issues. And especially during the pandemic, they've had to drop their slots because of uh, infection prevention measures. So actually getting a full lung function done is not as straightforward and there may be very long waiting lists. <laughs> so it's a bit unusual, but that's just uh, the UK practice. Um, in other places in the world, I knew you can get a spirometry fairly quickly. And I think if you are able to do one every three months, probably it's great if your patient is not really stable. If they are quite stable, probably every six months to a year, it's useful to have a lung function done. Now, at each consultation, just moving away a little bit from this, I would probably do an electrocardiogram, just a simple ECG, just to check if there's anything that really pops up. 
So I would probably do that as routine. It's a very cheap test to do. And I think even though it may not pick up any sort of uh, palpitation uh, cause, <laughs> it might just show you that things are fine. And you can look at, uh, you know, any sort of um, PR intervals, you know, things like that, that might show you that there may be something going on. So you can probably try to document these. So uh, looking carefully at the ECG, and measuring the different intervals might actually give you some indication if the heart transmission, the electrical system, the wiring is, is good, doing well. I would then think about doing some imaging potentially, but if the patient is absolutely stable, I would probably not even do an x-ray. This is just my practice. I mean, some physicians will swear by doing a chest x-ray to monitor sarcoid but realistically if you only have lymph node involvement you probably won't see much and if you do have an abnormal chest x-ray you might want to consider if you've ever done a chest hrct high resolution ct scan that's really important to have done maybe at least once to see if there is actually parenchymal involvement you can't just rely on the chest x-ray i think in modern pulmonology but ch you know, chest CT scanning is not always readily accessible. But to do a high-resolution non-contrast scan, I think, is accessible in most parts of the world. Even though there may be a waiting list, it may not be very straightforward to get one. It's probably good to determine the extent of sarcoid involvement and to know what to monitor and to look out for. Is there fibrosis? Is there a lot of inflammation? Is there any opportunity to treat? Looking at the images in the context of your patient might actually help you determine whether you could intervene with treatment. And treatment decisions are really complicated in sarcoidosis, and I'm pretty sure anyone who's worked in this, uh, with patients with sarcoidosis will know that there's always this demand, well, should we treat it, should we not treat it? Uh, patients really want some treatment because they're not sure whether their symptoms will improve or not. So there's quite a lot of uh, a lot of things to, to consider. And I would say having a CT scan done is probably quite helpful. Now, the other thing is if you know that there is involvement of any other organs, you might want to consider referring the patient as appropriate for an eye exam, for a dermatology exam, if you think that you are not able to manage that condition. And then obviously, as an extra test, I probably will do routine blood tests um, at every consultation. So I would just do some routine full blood counts, uh, liver profile, a kidney profile, electrolytes, and potentially calcium levels. I think calcium levels are really important. And you can do an ACE level. So the angiotensin converting enzyme levels may be raised. In, it's not raised in all patients with sarcoidosis, but if it used to be raised at some point, you can use it as a marker of um, disease activity. So those, those things are quite useful. The calcium level is really important because if you do have an elevated calcium level, you may need to consider treatment for sarcoid because of the risks involved is in persistent high calcium. So, so th those are things that I would say are quite important. And then obviously, if you have a high calcium, you might want to ask your patients about sun exposure. You might want to ask a lot of other questions. So it, it you know, these tests have to be tailored on a case by case basis. But I think as a minimum, you probably should do, I don't know, like I would do an ECG and the blood tests that cover calcium levels as well. And in addition to kidney and liver function and full black count. And maybe the ACE level as well. And what would you see? So normally, if you do have sarcoid, it actually is a little bit of a confirmation. If you see the low lymphocyte count on, on a full blood count, that can you know just be a marker that you are indeed dealing with sarcoid. So I, I tend to do that if I can. Another test that I sometimes do is to, to get some aspergillus serology because there's been some association potentially sometimes with mold exposure, with uh, certain environmental exposures, worsening sarcoid. And this is something that maybe I'm sure there are some articles that we can find to, to support this, but uh, it's something that I would do personally, just especially if the patient is reporting that there is some mold or damp in their house. And um, there may be some other occupational exposures. You might want to ask the, the question. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that I would probably ask about family history. 
if there is family history of sarcoidosis or other interstitial lung diseases, lung fibrosis, or any other rare conditions. It's just something that I would document, and if there is some high correlation of sort of having all these random conditions in a certain family, I would wonder whether there is a familial predisposition, something related potentially to telomere dysfunction or other things which may lead to these sort of uh, rare conditions. Because at the end of the day, sarcoid is not something you will see in a, a very um, a large number of people. Then, to conclude the consultation, what I would do is probably have a conversation about treatment. And I think many patients are a little bit impatient when it comes to, to their treatment, especially if they're not treated and they have sarcoid. Because it's really hard to explain to someone that they are suffering from a condition. They may have uh, symptoms such as fatigue, um, occasional joint pain, you know, all kinds of things. But you may choose not to treat not to give long-term steroids. And I think it's really important to just tell the patients, and I've noticed this actually in my practice, that a lot of patients think that uh, they can just get away by having a short-term, uh, short course of steroids, which is not the case. And I think it's really important to tell patients that once we, once we start on steroids, we're looking at six months to a year of treatment at least. And I think once you phrase it in that way, many patients are a little bit reluctant to, to actually start a treatment if we don't feel there's going to be a lot of benefit. So it's important to also convey to patients that sometimes sarcoidosis goes away without treatment. And I think just giving them that message as a physician does help a lot. And then I would probably just tell them what scenarios um, I would treat, you would treat sarcoid in in your case. So for example, if you have a high calcium level and you would say to your patient, look, this is why I'm monitoring your calcium levels, because if they go up a lot, I may need to treat you. Or um, let's say um, another situation would be if um, your lung function starts to go down and we worry that your lungs may be becoming, may be becoming scarred, fibrotic, we may consider treating to prevent that or um, if there's evidence of vital organ involvement, such as uh, central nervous system or heart involvement, then we may consider treating as well. And obviously, if, the, if there are symptoms that are unbearable, we may consider treating then as well. But I, I think if we outline these scenarios and that it's usually a team discussion to establish treatment, we may want to talk to a radiologist and see how they are uh, interpreting the chest uh, CT changes. If they think that there is uh, an opportunity to treat before things get worse, if there is a potential for fibrosis to, of the lungs to occur, we need to explain that treatment decisions in sarcoid are quite difficult and there's not a lot of evidence for when to treat and when not to treat. And I think if we just explain that to our patients briefly towards the end of the consultation, it may go a long way towards um, getting them on board to help us follow up their case. And actually, I would encourage patients to, to just report any symptoms that they may develop, the new symptoms, to keep track, to have some sort of a journal, to, to write it down in a notebook if something unusual happens to them. And I would also encourage them, if I give them an appointment, for example, in six months' time, because I think that their sarcoidosis is uh, stable and I don't feel that we need to see them more often than that, I would encourage them to just give us a call, give us uh, come by if there's anything that turns uh, comes up in the meantime that you know is relevant so um, just to give them that reassurance that we may be able to help them somehow and the other thing is probably the final thing i would discuss if especially if there is um, a patient who is a um, a woman who may want to have children i think it's important to just briefly have a conversation about that about the fact that it may be important for them to be on likely no treatment, no active sarcoid before they plan the pregnancy. And if they want to plan a pregnancy outside of that uh, domain where the sarcoidosis is active, they are still having treatments, to consider the risks. And that's something that I would touch upon, just just to sort of give them the, um, the opportunity to ask any questions about that. The, the last thing you would want is uh, for your patient to suddenly come to a consultation 
while they're on, uh, let's say, a long-term treatment with 15 milligrams of steroids, their sarcoidosis is all over the place, and they tell you, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm three months pregnant now. So, y you know, you might, you might want to just sort of prevent that from happening. So try to, to do things in a, in a planned way as much as possible and to support your patient's decisions. Now, this is pretty much what I would do in a follow-up sarcoidosis consultation. I know this video wasn't very structured, this episode wasn't very structured, but I tried to, to sort of give you an indication of what I would do in my clinic to sort of follow up um, the case. So just to summarize a little bit, I would just go over symptoms at the beginning, trying to cover all the bases, all the possible organ involvements. I would try to actively elicit symptoms from my patients, do a quick physical exam, um, request certain tests as more or less of a standard, so such as uh, simple routine blood tests that cover a full blood count, liver profile, kidney profile, calcium levels, and potentially an ACE level, and then I would do an ECG. And then everything else I think would be optional depending on what I think the level of stability in that case is. So hopefully you found this helpful. I'll try to make more videos about interstitial lung disease in the future. And well, podcasts, I keep saying videos, but actually I'm trying to record this as a podcast, but also keeping the video on. So hope you found this helpful. If you have any qu queries, comments, uh, suggestions, do leave them in the comment section below the video on YouTube. If, uh, if you are there, I'm not sure how you would do it with a podcast, but hope there is a way for, <laughs> for you to reach out. Thank you very much for watching and all the best to you.